<laughs> My name is Ryan Giesecke. Uh, I'm from up in the Dallas area, president of Trinity Valley Beekeepers up there. Um, also pretty active in both state organizations. Worked on several committees with TGA this year. Recently agreed to be the chair of the communications committee for the new Lone Star Beekeepers Association. Um, and overall just trying to contribute everywhere I can. Uh, if you are interested in going to Summer Clinic this year, you'll find me giving two talks out there as well. Uh, but today we're going to be talking about honeybee biology. Um, this is going to kind of breeze through this pretty quick. Obviously, this is a really big topic. I kind of love this topic because it's an excuse to really just kind of talk about whatever we want to talk about about bees. And we get to talk about how they do it without us rather than focusing on what we're messing up, right? So uh, it's going to be a fun one. Um, we're going to start with some of the more sciencey stuff on this. Um, I don't really emphasize learning anatomy too much. What I do think is there's certain aspects of it we need to understand because they impact our management. Um, certainly bees have six legs, four wings, compound eyes, simple eyes in the middle of their forehead. Simple eyes in the middle of their forehead kind of matters to us because that's what we're going for. That's what we're trying to work with when we talk about light on the trips to our hive in the morning. When bees are looking at flowers and things in detail, like you and I look at things, they use the big compound eyes. But the simple eyes in the center of their forehead are really their light sensors. So this is the reason that we need to care about light exposure on the hive. This is how they're going to decide when they walk out the door whether they've got time to work today or not, right? Um, aside from that, I think it's worth acknowledging that the proboscis, or the bee's tongue, is important. Um, this is going to limit what they can reach. Uh, certain flowers that lay wide open are going to be better forage for bees than flowers that are in long, narrow to, to them. It's going to be harder for them to reach down into it with the limited tongue length, right? Uh, it's also going to come into play in terms of passing pheromones later when we get to that. Uh, that aside, pollen collection, uh, pollen baskets on their hind legs, really important if we're not doing a hive inspection, <laughs> as JJ said but instead trying to tell what we can assess from the outside. Uh, this is something I'm definitely watching for. How much pollen is going in the front door of my hive? It's definitely an indicator on what's available in your area. It can to some extent be an indicator of how much brood they're raising. They're not gonna be piling in massive amounts of pollen if they're not raising any brood. Uh, it, it's a good assessment of what you can tell from the outside. And of course, most of us are already familiar with the sting to some degree, right? <laughs> Uh, internal anatomy, the only thing I really think we need to focus on here is again the ability to forage. So when they're carrying nectar or even water, honey, they're carrying it in this crop or honey stomach. A worker bee can carry about 40% of her weight in her honey stomach. So that's a lot of load, right? So even though this is internal and we can't necessarily look at it like we can the pollen and say is that bee carrying something or not, sometimes we'll see an indicator anyway. You watch the entrance and, you know, some bees come and land right on the edge of the entrance pad, no problem, march right in the door, and some of them come and end up hitting about two inches low and bounce off and try again. I mean, that's a pretty good indicator some of these bees are coming back heavily loaded with something that they've been foraging and carrying internally. Uh, similarly, if you see bees, uh, you're looking at a hive and trying to decide, is this hive being robbed? Is some of this negative activity around this hive? I've felt like in robbing situations, you see some of those robbers come out of that hive carrying all the honey they can carry and lurch off the front of the hive and just about hit the ground before they get taken off. So we're worth realizing there can be weight there. Um, honeybees are eusocial. This matters a lot to me in management. It certainly matters a lot to me when I'm doing removal work as well. Um, I find that it makes a lot more sense to think about this colony of bees as one organism living in this box, rather than thousands of bugs living in this box, right? It makes more sense in my management approaches. It's a consolation prize of sorts when you do crush a few bees that you didn't mean to, either sliding bars together or stacking boxes back up. It's not about those couple of bees that died, it's about what's good for the overall organism. And as beekeepers, there should really be a point to each inspection, trying to have a positive impact that outweighs any negative impact you might have by crushing a couple workers, right? But um, scientifically speaking, eusociality is cooperative care of offspring, overlapping generations within a colony, division of labor into reproductive and non-reproductive castes, which we certainly see with our bees, and individuals of at least one caste lose the ability to perform jobs of others. 
Um, this is all very true and very easily observed in our colonies. Um, and we really can see these individuals all functioning this way within a colony. If a worker bee stings you, it's not because she's trying to protect herself. She's going to die because she stung you. She's trying to protect the overall organism. Similarly, we'll see some worker bees simply sacrifice themselves in extreme circumstances. Uh, it's basically the same thing our bodies do when we sacrifice um, unhealthy cells for the sake of the good of the overall organism. Uh, it's called apoptosis when our bodies do it at a cellular level. We could call it social apoptosis with honeybees. And we'll see it with nosema, for example. Sick bees infected with nosema will sometimes simply fly away from the colony never to return, rather than pass it around for the rest of the organism. So, um, you're going to realize relatively quick I'm a bit of a big picture person, so I have to acknowledge that there are other eusocial organisms on the planet besides our bees. Uh, most closely related to our bees, of course, are wasps and ants, um, and other species of bees besides the honeybees we're keeping as well, but even things as weird as this naked mole rat here have eusocial societies as well. There are other types of honeybees, and I want to just briefly address this. We're going to kind of fly through it because it's not very applicable to our management. But there's seven species of honeybees in the world, only one of which we have in the US, and that's Apis mellifera. Um, but the others matter to us as well as American beekeepers, believe it or not. Um, does anybody know why we might care about the other seven species and some level of understanding of them? Yeah? Disease resistance or emergence of new disease or pathogens? Right, exactly. Some of our diseases and pests are coming from other similar species. Very well said. Um, so, we have the giant Asian honeybee, Apis dorsata. Um, obviously lives fairly different from our bees. One big piece of exposed comb, significantly larger bees. Matters because TIS, Texas Apiary Inspection Service, is telling us we need to be on the lookout for a new potentially emerging pest in the US. It's called the tropolalaps mite. It's coming to us from the giant honeybee and the dwarf honeybee, which comes next. Apis floria, again, similar to the giant one's exposed comb. Uh, function in a lot of ways similar to the bees we're keeping, other than general um, external appearances kind of thing. <coughs> Apis serrana is very similar to the bees we're keeping. If we're not talking in scientific terms, we could say the eastern honeybee versus we're keeping the western honeybee. Apis serrana definitely is contributing to some of our disease and pest problems in recent years. Can somebody tell me a specific problem that came to us from Apis serrana? Varroa. Varroa, definitely. Also Nozema serrana. We have two species of Nozema now. The Nozema apis we traditionally had, and Nozema serrana is relatively new. Um, very similar to our bees, which is why we're getting multiple problems from them, multiple layers of comb inside the cavity. In fact, managed very similar to the bees we're keeping inside their native range, although certainly not here. Of course, races of honeybees come into play as well, or we could say subspecies of honeybees. Um, I love this chart because it gives me something to put on this slide. I really <laughs> dislike this chart because it gives you this idea that you can look at them all and clearly tell which is which. That's entirely untrue, and especially untrue in the US because let's face it, in America, we have a good old fashioned American mutt as a honeybee. Um, different mixes within that, shades of gray in one direction or another, but a good old fashioned American mutt nonetheless. Um, I wouldn't get too caught up in this. Um, realistically, a lot of these are getting muddier and muddier around the world as we've moved bees around the world. Um, the African genetics are worth being to some extent aware of because we do have colonies that are significantly hyper-defensive in some parts of Texas due to the African influence. Even that's not as clear-cut as you might like to think. Some studies have shown that about 40% of Africanized bees are actually every bit as docile as a European hive next to them. But it's worth being aware of the fact that they can be significantly more defensive and provide challenges in management. Um, this is a fairly dated chart that shows that they were substantially established in the South, the Africanized honeybees, when this chart was done, done up. I haven't seen anything much more recent than about 2006, because basically we've all thrown up our hands and said, well, they're here. <laughs> um, <laughs> even the honeybee lab down at a and for the most part, doesn't do testing for African genetics anymore, with the exception of queen rearing programs. Um, so it's really just a matter of understanding that if you have 
mean bees. You need to do something about that before it becomes more of a problem. You need to decide where your tolerance levels are and work from there. How do you do that? Yeah. How do you do that? That's a great question. How do you do that? Um, that could be its own entire presentation, so I'm going to try and stick to a brief version here. For the most part, my answer with a hyper-defensive hive is just immediately break them down small. Uh, if I've got a stack of four boxes out there that's being extraordinarily defensive and hard to deal with, first thing I'm going to do is go out there one day and simply unstack the boxes into four hives, put a top and a bottom on them, go back and check it soon, right? I'm not leaving it that way long enough for wax moths or hive beetles to run away with the chaos I've created. But leaving it that way long enough that those bees sink in for a second, three of those boxes realize they're queenless, and you start to get, get a situation that's a little more manageable when you go through and try to find the queen, right? Some people will tell you to do it with queen excluders instead. I would just unstack them. Um, okay, so now you've got the mean guys in one box, now what? Well, now you've probably got mean guys in three boxes. <laughs> you've got a mean queen in, or four boxes, but you've got a mean queen in one box. So now you're going out there a couple days later and you can probably tell by picking up brood frames which box has the queen in, right? So you're going through and you're finding that queen, you're killing that queen off. At that point, you could be reintroducing a queen, you could be putting newspaper layers and stacking those boxes back up. Generally, my approach would be to just combine those resources into other colonies at that point rather than try to get them to accept a new queen. Uh, or conceivably, if you're looking to produce some more hives, break those down into, you know, rather than four 10 frame boxes, eight nukes, and then get them to accept a queen. Smaller colonies are usually easier, easier to reap with. Um, so short version, that's kind of what I would lean towards. What was the newspaper about? Uh, the newspaper was just to uh, address any possibility that you're gonna have fighting between them because they've been separated. Sometimes you can successfully combine things back if it's hadn't been an extended period of time and you haven't introduced a new queen. On occasion, I've had bees that have been apart for 24 hours determined to kill each other when I put them back together. <laughs> and I don't know why. So um, if I was doing the com combined back together, I'd probably do a layer of newspaper and sugar, sugar water on it as a preventative measure. Um, so let's talk a little bit about casts of honeybees. Hopefully we're all familiar with the fact that there are three casts of honeybees in our colony. Hopefully we can identify what they look like, not only as adults, but also in brood stages. Uh, occasionally I see a Facebook post from somebody saying, what are these things that are in my colony growing between the frames? It's inevitably drone larvae that they're breaking when they're opening up between the boxes. The bees have tried to build comb to, grow, uh, to raise drones because there's worker foundation in those boxes and there is nowhere else. When you break it open between the frames, somebody ends up saying, well, what are these white worms? Uh, so make yourself familiar with the three casts, both as adults and in development. Um, workers, of course, we're probably pretty familiar with. This is what most people think of when they think of the honeybee. Um, they are doing all the work in the colony. And um, what I think we sometimes overlook is what pattern they're doing that work in. And this can be really useful to us in our management. Um, if you look real close at this, you'll notice the numbers don't quite match. I pulled from two sources here. You know, the reality is the bees aren't reading either one of these books, so they're probably okay. Um, they're pretty close, and this is kind of generalizations anyway. But basically what we see is that worker bees start off with safe, easy tasks at home. Not that different from what we do with our kids, right? <clears throat> Clean your room first. We're not going to send them up a ladder to do a bee removal, bee removal or something crazy like that, right? So start off with safe, easy tasks around the house, self-cleaning, nurse bee, taking care of feeding new offspring. Eventually wax production, this is a little bit more draining on the worker that's doing this. Um, from there we see quite a bit of diversity, capping, drone feeding, taking care of the queen, comb building, water carrier guard, fanning, undertaking, all these roles that you may see. And the reality is if we put all very young bees in a colony, as soon as some of them got old enough to take orientation flights and start going out, they'd go ahead and start foraging, even though it's ahead of schedule. This isn't set in stone, but this is what they tend to do, right? Um, and foraging normally would be the last job of a worker bee. This is beneficial because foraging is dangerous, right? You might think it would be more dangerous to defend the colony and maybe die stinging a beekeeper. 
But the reality is, foraging is pretty intimidating. We talk about bees foraging two, three, five miles out, and it sounds like a lot to us. When you think about it at the scale of a honeybee in the wide world full of predation and everything else going on out there, this is really an overwhelmingly dangerous and almost insurmountable task, right? Um, also, it's advantageous to have foraging be the last activity because lots of bees die out in the field rather than in the colony, and you need less undertakers as a result. <laughs> now, why does this all man matter to us in management? Well, for one thing, we're talking about the deadly issues we have with Varroa, right? If you are monitoring Varroa mite counts in your hives, you always want to be working with nurse bees. Varroa mites favor nurse bees as the bees they're going to feed off of in their phoretic stages when they're on the bees, not in the comb, okay? Nurse bees are the young bees. We can always find them on the brood comb. We can always find them doing what? Feeding what stage of brood? Larva. Larva, open brood, right? So if we're gonna do a Varroa mite count, we need to understand all this enough to go, okay, I'm gonna find a frame with open larvae in the cells. That's the frame I'm gonna to shape to get my Varroa mite counts and monitor my Varroa mite thresholds to decide if I need to. Certainly making splits, it's important to understand this as well. You wanna get a somewhat valid balance when you're making splits. Um, I wanna talk about wax a little bit. Wax is really important, especially if we're talking about uh, different options for hive styles, right? Top bars, you're faced with harvesting wax when you harvest honey, whereas in a Langstroth, you may have an option to conserve that wax in the colony. Um, personally, I run foundationless Langstroth hives primarily, so I do a little bit of both despite being uh, focused on lens. And in fact, it's advantageous to cycle wax out eventually anyway. Opinions vary, but somewhere around the five year mark, we probably consider wax old enough that it's contaminated by too many things that have soaked into it, both in hive chemicals and stuff the bees bring back. We want to rotate it out at some point regardless. But we don't want to rotate it out too promptly. Wax is important, right? Not only is it important, but it's valuable. It's hard to make. There's a strong investment in it. Uh, wax is produced using more than seven times its weight in honey is what I put on this slide. I think I've seen numbers ranging from 7 to 12 or 15, something like that. So I put more than and used the lowest number so nobody could correct me. <laughs> um, basically, it takes weight in honey to make wax. So don't harvest it too lightly, right? We, we want to make use of our wax. We want to rescue what we can, not just throw it on the ground and go, I'm going to make more all the time, right? Um, I love the fact that they use the wax so efficiently. I love mentioning hexagons and why they make sense. Um, any other option ends up with wasted space between the cells, or it ends up with uh, issues with strength or efficiency. Hexagons work real well for this. Um, I will say that I always have to fix this because orientation is like so. That's where the strength to the hexagon comes from, is in part from having that uh, support directly under each cell. If you are rescuing comb, if you are doing removal work and strapping in comb or attaching comb, keeping the orientation right is beneficial. I won't say it's vital. It's not exactly vital, but it's beneficial, okay? So let's talk about foraging behavior a little bit. Um, certainly we understand our bees are going out and they're gathering nectar, they're gathering pollen. They're also gathering water. Um, this is one of the balancing factors that I would tend to think about when I am thinking about how much sun is too much sun for my colony, right? Reality is it's a pros and cons question. More sun tends to lead to more heat, which tends to lead to less problems with varroa mites and small hive bees. More sun and more heat also leads to more energy spent foraging for water. Because not only do they heat the colony in the winter time, uh, in the winter time by shivering their mu wing muscles and creating muscle energy heat, they also cool it through evaporative cooling during the hot summer months. So if that hive is, you know, about to hit 105 every day and they're trying to do something about that, they're going to be going forging water, bringing it back in their proper honey stomach, spraying it out, and evaporative cooling inside of the hive. It's a downside if they're doing too much of that. They're not doing something else, right? Um, so, providing water sources makes sense. Um, they definitely prefer a water source that is always there. If you provide a water source six days out of seven, you're going to find them hitting something else before long. It's got to always be there. 
They don't necessarily like the cleanest water source. They're not looking for the water you and I would think looks best. Um, in fact, they're perfectly willing to take water sources from pools, even contaminated with chlorine and other things. Um, some research has shown that they actually prefer water sources that have more minerals and salts and other things in them as well. Um, which brings to mind the fact that they're really not just foraging for all the things that we normally think of either. You'll hear occasional accounts of bees foraging on everything from blood to urine to potting soil. And they're looking for various, um, they're not looking for things to make, nectar, uh, make honey with necessarily, but they're looking for various salts and minerals. And things to make. Um, tree sap, of course, is also something they forage for. They're going to use this to make the propolis. If the wax is the building blocks inside the hive, then the propolis is the glue or the mortar or sealant, basically. Um, so they are going to forage for that. And really, any sugar source is going to be desirable to our bees. It's something they can store to make honey and food preserves out of. Um, some of the darker honeys you hear called woodland honeys are frequently largely sourced from honeydew, from aphids. Aphids eating the plants and actually excluding, uh, it's creating a uh, sugary substance that will attract the bees and they can use it even though the aphids can't. Uh, it makes good honey if you don't think about it too much. <laughs> uh, worth understanding the waggle dance. Um, I always say this and wish there was a more scientific term for it or something. Um, believe it or not, waggle dance is what it's properly called. It's not just the kindergarten version. Um, and this is a fascinating aspect of bee biology to me, and it really factors back into that this is one organism working cooperatively, not a bunch of indi individuals all doing their own thing, right? Because they're not just going to go out and stumble around until they find food and bring it back to the colony. They're telling each other where to go find the same food source they've already discovered. And I love it because with this simple dance, they're actually telling each other four things about foraging locations. And we see this bee here in the center shaking. She's so, so dancing so fast, she's blurry. But we can still make out little patches of yellow pollen on her legs, right? So she's first off dancing about something specific, and the other bees can still smell it on her. She is dancing about finding, let's say, sunflower pollen down the road, OK? So she's dancing about sunflowers. She's dancing this little squashed figure eight that we see here, looping around waggling up the middle, looping around, waggling up the middle again. And the direction of that line as up matches the sun tells the bees what direction they're going to fly when they go out the door of the colony to go find this food source. The number of waggles in that little line says how far in that direction you're going to go to find this food source. And the excitement with which this bee continues to repeat this dance says how good a find she found. Is this a couple flowers on the curb down the street, or is this a field of sunflowers down the road and everybody go get some, okay? <coughs> so this matters to us as beekeepers because we need to realize that two hives side by side are not visiting the same forage, right? If I've got a hive sitting here and a hive sitting here. It doesn't matter that they're six inches apart. They're still going to each find their own food source and each send their hive to it, right? Now they may sometimes hit the same ones too, but you can't assume they are. You may see exposure to problems in the field in one of them, you don't see in the other. You may see totally different honey in the two hives, even though they're side by side. It's not a matter of something being wrong, it's just the way they work. It's the way forage is accomplished for them. Of course, they're going and getting all this nectar because they're going to turn it into honey. And they're also eating it some as nectar. Um, in this picture, we can definitely see nectar and honey. If somebody who hasn't said anything yet, tell me which side of this picture has honey and which side of this picture has nectar. Oh, wow. top, top is honey, bottom is nectar, absolutely. They'll cap it when it's honey. Matters to us in harvesting. You harvest too much uncapped comb, what's going to happen to your honey? It's going to burn it, exactly. So we need to understand that, um, you know, at its root, Honey processing, honey production, is largely a drying out process. There's some enzymes at work, there's some other things at play, but a large part of this is this nectar going from averaging about 85% water content, depending on the plant, to being in the upper teens as honey. A lot of drying out going on, right? 
um, which explains why some years it would take longer to cure and longer to cap. If it's more humid outside, they're going to struggle more to get this accomplished. Uh, bee bread. I love talking about this one. I realized as I was uh, flipping through this before the meeting today that I'm wearing the wrong shirt because I'm about to criticize people who call pollen in the comb pollen. Uh, it is actually just as wrong as it is if we call honey nectar or vice versa. Bee bread in the comb is processed pollen. It's easy to look in this and say, okay, pollen cells. Fair enough. I say it too. But what we're seeing is a processing. Um, when they bring this pollen back to the hive, they're adding a little bit of nectar to it. There's a little bit of a fermentation process going on here that's curing this pollen into bee bread. There's a little bit of fungal and bacterial activity as well going on here that's curing this into bee bread. Um, some of the recent studies on the impact of fungicides in our colonies have shown that there is a negative impact from fungicides, not because it's killing the bees, but because it's decreasing their ability to turn pollen into bee bread. And bee bread is much better food for larvae than pollen is. Okay? When this is finished, you have one over here that's like three down, but it's almost full? Yeah. Will they all be like that? Um, they'll be very in depth to some degree. They keep it itemized by what the <coughs> pollen source was. You usually see one color per cell. Um, they'll never get all the way full, they never cap them. Um, they'll for the most part, I would say this all looks finished. All looks? Look, looks like filled cells. Okay. Yeah. Um, so pheromones are probably the most fascinating aspect of bee biology to me, if I had to pick one thing. Although I may have said that before in this presentation. If I did, then I'm getting over enthusiastic. Um, there's a long list of pheromones going on in our hives, and we're only going to try and talk about four of them today. Probably four of the ones that are best understood, and probably four that apply to our management quite a bit. So um, QMP, first off, is queen mandibular pheromone. QMP. Um, and basically, when we look at pictures like this, we tend to look at that and say, well, those beads around her are the queen's attendants. They're taking care of the queen, right? And that's true, and that's important. And yet, at the same time, what we're overlooking when we say that is that these bees are doing an equally vital duty in that they're taking queen mandibular pheromone, which the queen produces next to her mandibles, and passing it out through the colony. Some of these pheromones we tend to think of as smells, right? Think of QMP as a taste instead. They're passing it around the colony. Their proboscis, or tongue, is extending out. It's called trophallaxis, when members of a colony pass something back and forth tongue to tongue. And through trophallaxis, the worker, the queen is passing QMP to the workers, and the workers are passing it back to the rest of the colony. This tells the rest of the colony we've got a good, happy, healthy queen right situation going on here. We don't need to think about raising a new queen, right? Very important pheromone. Um, open brood pheromone is also important. Just like QMP tells the workers we have a queen, QMP is very, uh, Sorry, open brood pheromone is very important in telling the workers not to develop their ovaries, right? We all know that workers don't lay eggs and produce in our colonies, but that's because we have a queen right situation. A colony that is hopelessly queenless, you'll eventually start having laying workers, they'll start laying eggs, they're anatomically incapable of mating, but a male honeybee comes from an unfertilized egg, so they can still lay drones. Um, it's a tricky situation to rectify if you're facing it in your colony, but open brood pheromone is the one fairly reliable answer there. If you really need to fix a queen uh, laying worker colony, the best way to do it is to pull open brood frames or cones from another colony, introduce them over a period of time until you suppress the laying worker's ovaries, and then you can introduce a new queen. Frequently a laying worker colony will simply kill a queen if you try to fix it by just introducing a new queen. Uh, Nazanoff pheromone is what you see going on here. This is basically the way the bees say, hey, the colony's over here. Um, I've heard beekeepers call it pretty poetically the come hither pheromone. <laughs> I'm not sure why it deserves that much poetry, but you know, it's memorable at least. Uh, Nazanoff pheromone is released from a gland that's located <coughs> in between the folds of the exoskeleton on the bee's abdomen. So they literally need to make this pose to uh, suitably release this pheromone. 
And they're posed like that, fanning their wings backwards, spreading this out, right? Um, again, important management. Uh, doing removals, I'm frequently releasing queens back at the bee yard from a queen clip, right? And when I release that queen from the queen clip, it's sort of like if you're releasing a queen manually from a queen cage. She's never taken orientation flights and she doesn't know where her colony is, right? So if in that moment of trying to get her in the box, she suddenly takes to the air instead, she doesn't necessarily know where to go. Had conversations about this with several older beekeepers, and they told me, oh, well, if your queen takes to the air, what you need to do is get the bees to release Nasnov pheromone, because then she has a path to follow back, right? So what do you do? Well, you grab a frame covered in bees, you lift it up over the hive, you knock them all off and disorient them real good. At least some of those bees, when they hit the colony again, will be confused about where they are, start releasing Nazanov pheromone. Maybe you just upped your chances of getting your queen back. Um, alarm pheromone, of course, we're all probably pretty familiar with this. They do release it like a smell. They also release it when you get stung. Um, <laughs> You know, not a lot you can do to combat the fact that they're going to do this. What you can do is be aware that alarm pheromone is not very unique to one colony. Alarm pheromone from this colony can quite easily set off this colony over here to be worked up as well. Um, it may be a reason to spread hives out some if you're working with some bees that are a little bit more on the defensive side. It may be the reason that if you've got one hive that's always the worst, you do them last, right? so that their pheromones don't get all the other hives just as worked up. Now what does smoking do to this? Smoking, uh, it, well, uh, it becomes a matter of us speaking for the bees to answer that question. So there is some debate on that. Um, but I tend to answer that smoking, one, does sort of stifle the alarm pheromone in the air in terms of getting, giving the bees something else to focus on. More than anything, I think alarm pheromone, uh, I think smoke, and induces the bees to go in and fill up their honey stomach with honey. At that point, a bee that's trying to save honey is not going to sting you. That's just wasting the honey she's carrying. Uh, and so they're focused, focused on filling up with honey and saving that honey rather than focused on stinging the beekeeper. Um, queen biology is, of course, of vital importance to us as beekeepers. This is where all of our workers are coming from. It's where all of the genetics in the hive are coming from. You know, you change out your queen and you have genetically a totally different hive as little as two months later, okay? Um, so your queen is important. Your queen really dictates your management style with her genetics. If what you're doing doesn't work for the genetics you're raising, you either need to change what you're doing or change your queen to something that can match your management and your priorities. Um, you know, she is doing all of the reproduction in the colony. You'll see numbers ranging from about 1,200 to about 2,000 eggs a day for peak production for most queens. Uh, this can be beneficial for us to understand. Uh, you can do the math on this and decide how much room your bees actually need for a brood nest. Now, like JJ said, I don't necessarily advocate queen excluders. I like letting the bees do what they're going to do and have room to work with. At the same time, if we do the math on the number of cells on a deep frame in a Langstroth hive, and the amount of eggs a queen can lay in a day, we can rapidly realize that a single deep box provides almost double the cells that are needed for a queen to lay continuously. Um, pollen and other things go into that box as well, some honey around the edges, so it's not always that simple. But the numbers can help us decide what we need to do in our nature, right? Um, of course, drones make up the other half of the reproductive situation in a colony. Uh, not a lot of control to be had there. The one thing I do usually mention on drones is I think it is worth letting your colonies produce some drones. I do not tend to advocate culling all your drone brood and treating them as though they're worthless in the colony. Certainly your drones aren't mating with your queens, even if you're raising queens. But your drones are mating with the colonies whose drones are mating with your queen. So if you're not in it for just this year, there is a long-term benefit in getting some of the genetics you've chosen out into the area around you. Um, certainly they don't do anything inside the colony, they tend to be a bit of a freeloader. Um, they'll be in there until they're ready to take mating flights, go out and mating flights. Successfully mating if you're a male honeybee is fatal. Of course if you choose not to mate, you're still in the same shoes before long because in the fall they all get kicked out anyway. <laughs> we get all females for the winter time. So, uh, you know, life is short and sweet for a male honeybee, I guess. Um, when we talk about mating flights, 
basically, the drones tend to not fly out as far as the queens do, which is why you tend not to get your own genetics in the colonies. Uh, they fly out to drone congregation areas, which um, the bees certainly seem to know where they are. There's been some back and forth on exactly what defines them year after year. Certainly, the bees aren't telling each other where they are. Drones from last year are no longer here. Nonetheless, they're in the same spots year after year, usually associated with geographic spots that create warm up updrafts. Um, and basically, your queen's going to fly out, go to a drone congregation area, already got a bunch of drones there. They're going to chase her. The strongest, fastest drones are going to successfully mate with her in flight. She'll mate with four to 20 drones on average, bring that back to the colony, and have all the genetic material she needs to fertilize or not fertilize eggs throughout the rest of her lifespan. Fertilizing them if she's raising females, queens are workers, not fertilizing them if she's raising drones. Uh, sounds like she's picking, but really it's the workers picking when they build the comb. And her, her reaction's just instinct. Of course, regardless of caste, we're seeing the same life cycle for the development period. We see start with an egg, go from an egg to a larva, larva to a pupa, at which point the bees cap the cell. Uh, we're thinking about varroa mites again. Varroa mites are reproducing inside of this capped cell. Um, and then when that pupa is fully developed, it will, in most cases, chew its own way out of the cell. Sometimes you see workers seeming like they're trying to help queens out of the cell to some degree. Uh, workers certainly chew their own way out. And the only thing that really different, differentiates the different casts at this point uh, is development time. And here we have blue is egg, red is larva, and orange is pupa. Uh, queens come out real fast. Does anybody, has, does anybody have any thoughts on why queens would have learned to come out really fast? What's the advantage to being the first queen out? You get to kill your competition before they can fight back. Exactly. So queens come out real fast. Workers take a little longer, 20 to 21 days. Uh, drones take about 24 days. Basically, to some degree, that's probably just drones aren't a priority. They're not doing anything for this colony. It's just about getting genetics out into the rest of the world, right? Uh, and to some degree, it's the larger drones taking along the development time as well. Uh, this longer development time is why varroa mites favor our drone broods so heavily. More time for them to reproduce in that cap cell because this is longer than these, right? Um, Having talked about laying workers a little bit and talked about reproduction in general, I do have to go back to that big picture and name off the exceptions. Um, laying workers, again, are workers who have started developing their ovaries because of an absence of queen pheromone and open brood pheromone that tells them a colony is on the verge of dying hopelessly queenless, right? Basically, this is a dying colony taking one last chance to get their genetics out there somewhere, okay? It's a natural reaction to a colony that's dying, but it is a colony that's dying. Certainly, if you're doing your five to seven day inspections, you're hopefully going to catch them long before you actually have a laying worker situation taken over. Um, and I just had to mention it because it was on here. We also have one subspecies of this species of bees we keep, the Cape honeybee from South Africa that is actually capable of, without mating, laying eggs that become females. So they can actually be a parasite on other colonies that way. These are genetics that, for the most part, have not been found in the US at this point. And there's still some, some work going on on how to best prevent them from being an issue here. Um, how many went on time? 15 minutes. Uh, 15 minutes. OK. All right. Then we're going to skip this next slide, which was my temporary endpoint if I needed it. And we're going to get to talk about colony reproduction as well, right? Because we talked about individual reproduction after saying it's important to remember this is one group organism. So how does that group organism reproduce? Um, and this is a fairly abbreviated version of this. I've got a whole presentation on swimming as well. Um, but basically, swarming is colony reproduction in most cases. Um, certainly we see this cluster of bees in a tree, we tend to assume that's what's happened. We would tend to assume that 40 to 60 percent of the workers left with the old queen from an existing strong colony. That colony is in the process of raising new queens. First one out is going to become the queen and then she's going to take mating flights and start this whole process all over. 
it kind of divides the risk here. Because an old, already mated queen is out taking the risk of trying to find a viable spot for a new home. And the parent colony is now taking the risk of will a queen come back from her mating flight successfully and they able to reproduce, right? Um, so this would be our normal primary swarm. Sometimes we'll also see, uh, I don't have a next slide on that. Sometimes we'll also see after swarms, which would be much smaller swarms, usually a second or third swarm after a primary swarm. It's important realizing this if you're catching swarms, because some people will tell you to put a swarm behind a queen includer, queen excluder, in this case includer, to keep them in the colony. But a virgin, virgin queen in an after swarm may not be able to fit through that, and a virgin queen doesn't do a colony any good at all, right? So on smaller swarms, it's worth taking into account the possibility that you've got an after swarm with a virgin queen rather than an old mated queen. Uh, of course, colonies have scone, like JJ was saying. Colonies have scone uh, because of a beetle problem or something else. Um, we can't tell this colony was a reproductive swarm and not an absconded colony, right? Sometimes time of year gives us a hint. When I got my first call last year to go pick up a swarm and it was the second week of January, I can pretty confidently say that's not a reproductive swarm because there are no drones for that colony's new queen to mate with. That pretty much had to be an absconded situation. But absconded situation would be an entire colony abandoned a home and went to go find a new home rather than dividing and keeping the colony in the existing location. Um, I mentioned package bees here simply because package bees are essentially an artificial swarm. What are we doing when we create a package? We're taking a bunch of workers, pairing them with a queen, and creating loose bees that are going to make a home somewhere. That's what we've got with the swarm, except that a package tends to come with a young queen, freshly mated, not the year-old queen mated or the virgin queen that we talk about with natural swarms. Um, and it's worth being aware that some of the Africanized genetics have carried with them a tendency to try and usurp other colonies. So instead of sending out a big swarm to find a cavity of their own, some of the Africanized genetics will send out a small swarm, looks a lot like an after swarm, but instead of landing on a tree and trying to find a hollow space to move into, they actually go latch onto the side of an existing colony, then rush in the door and try to take over. You see both queens go into a ball of bees for a minute, Usually the usurpation genetics know what they're doing a little bit more than the European genetics know how to defend against it. This is a way you could potentially suddenly get genetics you're not ready for in your colony, even without queen cells, even without a swarm. It's worth being aware of. It might be a reason you consider marking queens. Um, now I love the process that these use to evaluate nest sites. At this point I should mention that I stole graphics from Dr. Tom Seeley for several slides in a row. Um, these are all out of his book, Honeybee Democracy, which is $20 on Amazon if you want to look for it. And they even just put out a new audio book of it, but I think it's just a couple bucks more if you are more the listening type. Um, but these are some of his charts that show bees bouncing around inside of a space and trying to decide how big it is, whether the cavity size is sufficient for a home. It's a little bit hard to understand how these two thought they had it figured out, but we can certainly see it down here. <laughs> Uh, they do evaluate cavity size, entrance size, sun exposure, entrance direction, and even looking for signs of previous <coughs> occupants, which is why it might make sense to put a little bit of old wax or old brood comb in a swarm trap or a bait hive, right? That one always throws me off a little bit because, you know, if I put myself in those bees' shoes and I go into this space and I find signs of a civilization that obviously collapsed in this location, <laughs> uh, part of me would go, okay, I'm not sure about this, but nevertheless, they like signs of previous occupants. They don't wonder where they went. Um, when they go out, they're actually casting votes, which is where the name Honeybee Democracy comes from for his book. Um, we've got a cluster of bees and we've got an optional nest side on each side. Let's say they're the same in every regard, other than this one has a little bit too big an entrance. This one would be more easily defended, right? So we have a scout go both places, and this is our red side, this is our blue side. They both come back, they both dance and recommend this spot they picked. It would work. Um, but the blue bee does it more enthusiastically, right? Back to our wagon <coughs> scenario. So more enthusiasm from our blue bee means that more blue bees go and check out this one than this one. Both are still being suggested, both are still viable op options, but this one is increasingly popular, right? Uh, 
they don't ever vote against anything. If we want to start trying to pull parallels into our society, they're always voting for something they believe in, not against something they dislike, right? Once you've recommended something, you simply stop dancing and let the next generation of scouts go carry this on. Uh, eventually, we get down here, and a scout goes over here and finds that there's already a bunch of bees from their colony at this location. That's the trigger that we picked this location. Not that we come to a unanimous decision here, that there's enough bees over here already that it's popular enough that we're going to go there, right? So at that point, they have not reached a consensus, but they have reached a quorum. And they'll take off for this location. And we may even leave a few bees behind who were voting for the wrong choice. So it goes. It's about the colony, not the individual bees. Uh, at that point, they take to the air. And we have a top view and a side view here. Um, basically, chaos in the air, right? If you've ever stood out in the middle of a swarm, it's lots of fun. They're not likely to sting you about it. Um, but you don't see patterns to it. You just see chaos. Um, so at that point, only a few of these bees that are flying around in the air know where they're going, right? And so they start making fast dashes through the top of it. The length of the arrows indicates the speed here. And they start making fast dashes through the top of this chaotic cloud of bees, saying, we're going this way, we're going this way. When they get to the front, they drop down and back, and then dash through the top of it again. And you get a direction and the cloud of bees starts moving in this direction, right? Um, eventually, they have actually traveled enough that they've reached the spot that they're going to make a new home, and they don't need a direction anymore. And those scouts know they're there now. So those scouts simply settle down at the entrance to the new space they picked and start releasing that Naznov forever. In absence of any direction, we just have chaos in the air again. The bees start trying to figure out where to go and they follow that Naznov pheromone to find the entrance and go in to establish a new colony. Okay? Um, at that point, they're settling in. They're doing much the same thing we would see if we were installing a swarm or a package in one of our colonies. Start drawing out this nice, new, fresh, white comb, kind of comb JJ was telling us to make cut comb out of if they later fill it with honey. And uh, they start bringing in food energy. At this point, as a beekeeper, we'd start supplementing their food to make sure they have plenty of energy to draw this out. And basically, the whole cycle starts off all over again. You successfully produced a new superorganism, a new, uh, new social organism. Any questions?